What would happen if you faced your fears and said yes to everything outside your comfort zone for a whole year? In Year of Yes, celebrated television screenwriter and producer Shonda Rhimes answers that very question. Her book relates how, by facing her many fears and moving through challenges instead of avoiding them, Rhimes was able to liberate herself from anxiety, self-doubt, and deep unhappiness. By consistently pushing herself out of her comfort zone, Rhimes discovered new ways to face many problems in her life fearlessly. She blossomed into a new person, empowered to fully embrace herself and her life with love. In this guide, we will examine Rhymes's transformative journey from a life of merely surviving to full-hearted thriving and outline the meaningful lessons she learned and wishes to pass on to her readers so they, too, can reclaim their lives from fear. Along the way, we'll compare the author's ideas to those of other similar self-help writers and provide additional context from sociology and psychology experts to help you better understand and apply Rhymes's insights to your life. Introduction from fear to love before the year of facing her fears began, Rhymes appeared to be on top of the world. She had an Ivy League education, a creative career she loved, fame, a beautiful home, and three wonderful daughters. She had worked hard to achieve success and recognition as the head showrunner for two wildly popular television shows, Grey's Anatomy and Scandal, and her production company, Shondaland, was working on a third. But behind the scenes, Rhymes was withering. She was overwhelmed by the demands of her career and coped by avoiding anything outside of work that pushed her out of her comfort zone. As a result, her life felt increasingly small and repetitive, she rarely socialized, and she stayed out of the public eye and hunkered down at home as much as possible. She refused every invitation to events, parties, award shows, and interview opportunities that came her way. Additionally, Rhymes worked under immense pressure because the success of her company and television shows rode squarely on her back. As one of the first black women to achieve such a high level of success and power in the entertainment industry, she felt she was working not only for personal success but also for the success of all black women in the industry. As a result, she felt obligated to never make mistakes. The pressure Rhymes felt as a black woman, that her failures would reflect on black women as a whole, is a common experience for members of marginalized groups that psychologists call stereotype threat. Research has shown that experiencing stereotype threats can be detrimental to people's mental health, work performance, and motivation. It can also make members of marginalized groups feel a sense of responsibility to break barriers and pave the way for others in their community, as Rhymes felt. One day, with the help of her sister's honest feedback, Rhymes realized that she wasn't happy or satisfied. She was letting her introverted personality, career, societal pressures, social anxiety, and self-doubt rule her life. As a result, she never said yes to anything challenging or scary. This realization inspired her to experiment with a new way of living, she committed to facing her fears. Because Rhymes was overwhelmed by the pressures of her career and lacked good coping skills for her stress and anxiety, she used a common but unhelpful tactic to feel better, avoidance. In The Upside of Stress, Kelly McGonigal explains that avoiding stress, like refusing to do anything outside your comfort zone, can cause stress to snowball. For example, avoidance can lead to isolation and substance abuse, which lead to more stress and harm. Instead, Kelly recommends changing how you think about stress, as your mindset can make the difference whether or not a stressful situation impacts you positively or negatively. The transformative commitments as Rhymes journeyed through her year-long experiment, embracing her difficulties instead of avoiding them, she discovered many areas of her life where she didn't feel satisfied, engaged, empowered, or free. To improve these areas, she made five transformative, liberating, yet challenging commitments that can change your life, too. Commitment number one, make yourself seen and heard. Commitment number two, re-examine your priorities. Commitment number three, get comfortable with conflict. Commitment number four, embrace your truth. Commitment number five, let go of unsupportive relationships. 
As we explore these commitments, we'll also share Rhymes's journey with them, showing how her experiences challenged her to restructure her approach to life, which eventually brought her to a place of greater vitality, freedom, and love for life. Commitment number one, make yourself seen and heard Rhymes describes herself as highly introverted and shy, making fame a difficult adjustment for her personality. But she realized that hiding herself from the world and letting her introverted personality and social anxiety dictate her life was not making her happy. To improve how she felt, she knew she must commit to being seen and heard by others, even though it was uncomfortable. She discovered the more she pushed through anxiety, accepted compliments, and walked with her well-earned swagger, the more comfortable she grew with being seen and heard, and she began to feel like her authentic self. Rhymes describes herself as a naturally introverted and shy person, two characteristics that are often confused with one another but are not the same. In Quiet, The Power of Introverts, Susan Cain explains that introverted people are often stereotyped as shy, but not all introverts are shy. Introversion is about feeling overstimulated and drained by social interactions, while shyness is more about fear of embarrassing social interactions. Being shy doesn't necessarily mean you have social anxiety, however. Shyness and social anxiety share characteristics like fear of embarrassment and nervousness about social interactions, but social anxiety symptoms tend to be much worse and cause more disruption to your life. Don't shy away from the public eye before her transformative year, being seen and heard in public had caused Ram severe panic attacks because she was afraid of being judged by others. She often passed up opportunities for events that would put her in the public eye, like interviews, because she was uncomfortable with that level of visibility. When she had to make public appearances, she kept her guard up and refrained from being vulnerable and showing her authentic self. Rhymes doesn't explicitly explore the root cause of her fear of vulnerability, but in Daring Greatly, Breen Brown explains that shame, self-doubt, and low self-worth are often the sources of our fear of being vulnerable with others. Brown contends that overcoming your aversion to vulnerability can help you feel more courageous, have more connection in your life, and feel more compassion toward yourself and others, as Rhymes did. As a part of Rhymes's experiment to face her fears, she decided to say yes to every invitation, and she accepted two opportunities she might otherwise have declined, a guest appearance on the Jimmy Kimmel Show and an invitation to deliver a graduation speech at her alma mater, Dartmouth. These events allowed her to face her social anxiety head-on, and she discovered that being vulnerable in public can be scary but also gratifying and fun. Rhymes's discovery that she could not only survive facing her fears but could also enjoy it might be explained by psychologists who contend that the experience of fear is similar physiologically and emotionally to the experience of excitement. One approach to scary situations, then, might be to reframe your racing heart and the butterflies in your stomach as a feeling of excitement rather than fear. We tend to label fear as an inappropriate or negative response and excitement as a positive one. Therefore, reframing your emotions can empower you to feel more in control of your mental state. Key takeaways It's okay to have some conditions before you agree to do something that scares you if they help you face your fear. For example, before agreeing to do Jimmy Kimmel Live, Rhymes insisted that the show not be live. This compromise helped her ease into the experience of doing something that terrified her. If you're speaking in public, you can calm your anxiety by tapping into what you have in common with your audience and how you might identify with them. When giving her Dartmouth commencement speech, Rhymes realized that the moment was not about her performance but about passing something valuable to the graduates, wisdom she wished someone had provided on her graduation day. Because of this realization, she was nervous before the speech but did not have a panic attack, which was a triumph for her. Other techniques experts recommend to overcome public speaking fears include prioritizing your preparation, speaking in public more often, practicing mindfulness, and even taking voice lessons to build your confidence in your speaking abilities. Though Rhymes doesn't mention these strategies specifically, her preparations align with some of these techniques, for example, by focusing on how she could bring value to the Dartmouth graduates, she introduced excitement into her preparations, and by insisting on a condition for her Kimmel interview, she was being mindful about what her limitations were. 
Accept praise and compliments during an award ceremony for women leaders in entertainment, Rhymes realized how uncomfortable she was receiving praise. She further realized that this reaction is common for women, even powerful women like herself can't easily accept praise and compliments because women are taught to make excuses for their gifts and successes in American society instead of gladly taking credit for them. The cause of women's difficulty in accepting praise for their accomplishments is explained by Sheryl Sandberg in Lean and as being an issue of women's likability. When women accept praise, they are acknowledging their success, and studies show that the more successful a woman seems to be, the less people like her. Successful women are seen as aggressive and unfeminine. Because being liked is a key factor in leadership, successful women learn to downplay their accomplishments to be more liked by the people around them. Rhymes decided to practice accepting praise without apologizing or explaining her accomplishments and gifts away. She learned that accepting compliments is a gift she can give herself and the person giving the compliment, it felt great to absorb other people's positive feedback, and it made her feel more connected to others. Researchers have shown that giving and receiving compliments does in fact make most of us feel more uplifted and connected to others, as it did for Rhymes. They found that, in general, we enjoy receiving compliments from strangers and we feel good when we give them to people as well. But many of us refrain from complimenting others because we misjudge how they will feel if we do, and we underestimate the positive impact that our words of appreciation can have. Additionally, many of us feel uncertain about our ability to compliment someone well. In reality, research shows that if you step outside of your comfort zone to compliment someone, it will likely have a more positive impact than you might imagine, both for them and for yourself. Key takeaways practice accepting praise as Rhymes did, when someone acknowledges your accomplishments or gifts, just smile, thank them, and then say nothing else. With practice, accepting people's praise will become easier. Rhymes initially found it awkward, but eventually it became her natural response. Accepting compliments is an act of kindness for you and others. When you don't accept them, even if you do so nicely, you're telling the other person that they're wrong and shouldn't have wasted their time. Not all compliments are acceptable. Rhymes's recommendation to accept compliments applies well when praise is related to your accomplishments. But compliments, especially ones directed at women, are often about people's bodies and appearances and can be unwelcomed, inappropriate, and, when taken too far, can be sexual harassment. A common tactic people use to avoid being accused of sexual harassment is to say they were complimenting as an excuse for their harmful behavior. In these cases, women should not feel obligated to smile or to thank the other person to make them feel happy about making this kind of comment. Unfortunately, there are no hard and fast rules when distinguishing inappropriate compliments. Many women are uncomfortable with compliments about their appearance, but not all. Additionally, the context of the compliment can make a difference, what feels inappropriate at work may feel fun and flirty at a bar. The bottom line is if someone offers you a compliment that makes you uncomfortable, you do not have to smile and say thank you. You're a badass. Don't hide it as Rhymes got more comfortable accepting praise, she noticed a positive shift in how she felt about her gifts and successes. She realized that she had been making her voice and presence smaller and quieter to make others more comfortable. Because of this realization, she committed to speaking up more, being candid, and displaying her personal power. Doing so liberated her to be herself around others, in all her glory, without shame. Rhymes practiced embodying what she calls badassery, the practice of knowing your accomplishments and gifts and celebrating them. Acknowledging her badassery transformed her relationships, she could now appreciate everyone else's contributions more because she wasn't wasting her energy hiding. Knowing, owning, and celebrating your accomplishments, strengths, and gifts is just one of the many tips Katie Kay and Claire Shipman outline in The Confidence Code for building more confidence in yourself. They also recommend taking action even when you're uncertain and not taking criticism of your performance personally, be open to feedback and view it as something helpful. Key takeaways women should remember that it's okay to be seen as powerful and confident. 
Rhymes notes that women in society are generally expected to be modest, agreeable, disarming, and defer to others' opinions and ideas. At the same time, men are allowed to have strong opinions, make decisions, use their voices, and take up space in the room. She advises that instead, you refuse to hide from the world. Rhymes's description of what it means to show confidence, using your voice to share your opinions and making decisions, is not the only way to display confidence, according to Kay and Shipman. They agree with Rhymes that women and men are expected by society to behave differently when it comes to confidence, and we're taught that the only way to show confidence is the way men typically display it, by being authoritative and commanding attention. But Kay and Shipman argue that different styles of confidence can be just as powerful because confidence isn't necessarily about your outward performance, it is about taking action. Everyone has greatness in them, and you can learn how to own your greatness by practicing badassery. It's okay to be the best at something and not apologize or make excuses. Tapping into your badassery amplifies confidence in yourself and those around you. When you aren't busy wasting your energy hiding, you can see others more clearly and appreciate their greatness. When you're confident in yourself, it's easier to appreciate other people's strengths, and Kay and Shipman argue that women especially should take that appreciation further to actively build confidence in other women. They recommend that women encourage one another to talk about their accomplishments and counsel one another to take action instead of merely being supportive and empathetic. Commitment number two, re-examine your priorities Rhymes loved her career. Before her life-changing year, she happily gave it most of her time and attention. But during the year, she realized she needed to better balance her priorities so that she didn't neglect her family or her health. She started prioritizing playtime with her children and rethought her relationship with food. With these changes, she felt more alive than ever. Prioritize pleasure and play to prioritize her family better, Rhymes committed to playing with her daughters more, which brought her immense joy and happiness. This meant that whenever her daughters asked her to play, she dropped everything and played with them, no matter what. Uplifted and refreshed by the joy of connecting with her children and the love they shared as a family, she felt more relaxed, creative, and grateful in all areas of her life. Achieving this shift in priorities was not easy for Rhymes at first as it required that she create parameters with her job that she didn't have before. Instead of letting work seep into her off-work hours, she committed to turning her phone off after 7 p.m. and avoided working on the weekends. Eventually, she found that her new relationship with work did not diminish her engagement with her job. In fact, she found the opposite, the more she prioritized playtime, the more energy and creativity she had for her work. In her TED Talk about her year of yes, Rhymes further explores how prioritizing playtime with her daughters positively impacted her career. She attributes this shift in priorities to saving her career. She explains how being a very driven and hard worker is part of her nature, but she was beginning to burn out and lose her creative inspiration, but she was able to reignite her experience of imagination and joy again by playing with her daughters. Prioritizing playtime renewed her capacity for creative thinking and gave her the energy she needed to continue working hard in her career. Key takeaways Anyone can prioritize playtime with their children, regardless of their life circumstances. For busy working parents, it might seem impossible, but Rhymes insists that it will not involve a significant time commitment. She found her daughters only wanted about 15 minutes of playtime with her before they moved on to other things. While Rhymes insists that every family can prioritize playtime in their schedules, this may be an overly optimistic and unrealistic expectation for many. Families with low income are not just commonly short on free time, but they also often struggle with having their fundamental needs met, like providing their children enough food. Experts estimated in 2021, more than 9 million children faced hunger. These families might find it hard to prioritize play. Play is not just for people with kids. Play is about carving out time daily to do what brings you pleasure and joy. Prioritize your version of playtime and you'll feel more centered, recharged, and fulfilled in your day-to-day -day life. In The Gifts of Imperfection, Brown expands on the definition of play, 
Not only does play bring you pleasure and joy, it has no other purpose but to bring you pleasure and joy. This distinguishes playing from other fun activities. Research shows that playtime, no matter your age, can increase your ability to connect with others, boost your creativity, and decrease your stress. Prioritize your health as courageous as Rhymes was in facing her social anxiety, she also took a brave and honest look at her relationship with her health and body. She decided that she would feel healthier and happier if she lost weight. By fully committing to the challenge, she succeeded in her goal, which connected her more to her body, boosted her confidence, and made her feel better physically. In choosing a healthier lifestyle, Rhymes worked to change her relationship with food. This was not an easy decision for her, eating was one of Rhymes's greatest joys and main ways of coping with stress and uncomfortable emotions. However, she could no longer deny how unwell she felt physically, so she decided that choosing weight loss was more important to her than choosing to continue her eating habits. To successfully do so, she tapped into her strong work ethic and committed to being healthy. Being in a fat body does not mean you must change Rhymes's personal journey to health does not reflect the right path to health for everyone who might be perceived as being overweight. And you just need to lose weight and 19 other myths about fat people, fat activist and author Aubrey Gordon explains how society has many deeply held, scientifically inaccurate beliefs and biases about fatness, the term fat is being reclaimed by people with large bodies to describe themselves and is not a derogatory word, much like the word queer has been reclaimed by the LGBTQ community. A few myths Gordon outlines about fatness are, 1. Contrary to popular belief, your body size is largely determined by factors outside of your control. Most people's bodies have a set point, the size their body naturally tends to be, which is determined mostly by genetics. 2. The healthy choice for fat people is not always to lose weight. In fact, Common weight loss strategies, like restricting calories and overexercising, can lead to weight cycling, which can have detrimental health effects over time, including metabolic diseases like diabetes. 3. Not all fat people use food to cope with stress and deal with difficult emotions. Emotional eating is an issue for people of all body sizes, and not every fat person has emotional eating issues that need to be addressed. Key takeaways Everyone's body is their own, and everyone has the power to choose what health and happiness mean to them. If you are unhappy with your health and body, you can make different choices and commit to them fully. However, if you choose not to make those changes, then you should accept the outcome of that choice. For example, if you choose to play video games all weekend, don't be upset about your stiff muscles on Sunday night. Accept that that's the outcome of your choice. Changing your relationship with your health is never an easy journey. If you recognize that it will be challenging, you'll be better able to accept the difficult times and stay motivated. Social factors can matter more than your personal choices. It's common for self-help sources to emphasize your personal responsibility to make better choices for your well-being, but there are reasons why you might not have full agency over your health choices. Having a lack of access to healthcare and information, having limited autonomy, and having different cultural and social values are all examples of what experts call social determinants of health. According to the World Health Organization, social determinants of health, like those listed above, can have a greater impact on health than healthcare or personal choices. Research shows that social determinants of health account for a significant percentage of health outcomes. Commitment number three, get comfortable with conflict before her transformative year, Rhymes would avoid conflict with others. During the year, she learned that conflict wouldn't bring about the end of the world, that she could assert her boundaries by saying no, and that having difficult conversations could bring her a measure of peace and confidence in herself. Ultimately, these realizations led to more honest and authentic relationships. Assert Your Boundaries Rhymes began to practice asserting her boundaries with people in her life. The more she practiced, the more comfortable she became with saying no when needed. She gained more trust in her instincts about what her boundaries were and when to assert them. Before she committed to boundary setting, Rhymes had felt obligated to say yes to every favor asked of her, and the lack of boundaries ran her ragged and took a toll on her finances. 
But once she adopted the practice of saying no, she felt this sense of obligation lessen. It is widely accepted among mental health professionals that personal and professional boundaries are beneficial for your mental health and enable you to have healthy relationships with others. Without them, you can lose track of your needs and preferences and, as a result, you may feel exhausted and resentful while attending to other people's needs and preferences over your own. With boundaries, you allow the other person to know where your lines are. In doing so, you give them the choice to respect your boundaries or not, which can tell you a lot about them and the relationship you share. Key takeaways when you embrace everything that scares you, you don't necessarily erase all your boundaries, but instead, you learn to listen to your inner voice and your intuition and say no when you need to. When you're clear with your boundaries, you make it clear to others what they should expect, which allows everyone to proceed with confidence. There are many ways to assert your boundaries, Rhymes recommends saying things like, I'm going to be unable to do that or that is not going to work for me. One of the early steps in establishing boundaries with others is to affirm for yourself that your needs and preferences are just as important as theirs. But first, you must get in touch with what your needs and preferences are by listening to your inner voice. In The Success Principles, Jack Canfield discusses three ways your inner voice speaks to you through your emotions, your thoughts, and feelings in your body. To hear your inner voice more clearly, he recommends practicing meditation and also asking yourself questions as if you were speaking to another person. Embrace difficult conversations in the process of getting more comfortable with saying no, Rhymes realized that she was capable of having difficult conversations of all sorts, like confronting people's passive-aggressive behavior or confessing mistakes she had made. The more willing Rhymes was to have difficult discussions, the more she could see that having conflict with others in her life was okay and even fruitful. She started sticking up for herself more and not letting others treat her poorly. She grew more courageous about being honest with people and spoke her mind aloud more often. Difficult conversations became something to lean into rather than avoid because they often revealed a truth, which set her free. Key takeaways Difficult conversations aren't always going to end the way you hope they will, but it is worth the risk. When you start embracing conflict and difficult conversations, some people might turn away from you, those who cannot tolerate conflict, accept the truth, or respect your boundaries. Despite this potential loss, you stand to gain much more, genuine authenticity in your relationships and more confidence in your ability to stick up for yourself and tell the truth. As Rhymes describes, avoiding conflict is not a good strategy if you want healthy, authentic relationships. But what happens on the other side of the spectrum when we continuously spark and perpetuate conflict with others? In The Anatomy of Peace, the Arbinger Institute explains that if conflict features heavily in your life, it's important to acknowledge the role that you're playing in its creation. If you desire more harmonious relationships, you may have to change your mindset and behavior to work with people rather than against them. Commitment number four, embrace your truth rhymes realized that when she embraced who she truly was and allowed herself to openly speak her truth, her beliefs, preferences, and limitations, she became less afraid of the things that had once scared her. She thus committed to living a life dictated by her truth, regardless of whether or not she conformed to societal standards. Own Your Limitations Rhymes was a single, full-time working mother, and she had at-home childcare to help her raise her daughters. She committed to being honest about all this to the press. She reflects on how society shames women for having help because women are expected to do everything themselves, have a successful career plus a happy family. Thus, very often, successful, famous women with children are not transparent about the help they have at home when they are asked to divulge their secret to juggling so many different roles in their lives. They act like they can do it all without help, which, Rhymes notes, is largely inaccurate. She decided to combat the shame associated with having help by being radically honest about her own life. Key takeaways It's okay to have help and be honest about it. No one can do it all alone. Women who have help managing their lives should not hide it. Pretending you don't have help sets unrealistic and harmful standards for women with fewer resources who feel like they're constantly failing because they can't keep up. 
The challenges that working mothers face Ramsa's observations about high-profile career mothers are part of a larger conversation about the myth of work-life balance for professional women and their families. Professional women have been told that they can have it all and do it all, succeed in their dream careers and be present, engaged wives and mothers. But increasingly, professional women are questioning the real-world limitations of this belief and are pushing back against the unrealistic standards that make them feel like they're always on the verge of failure. In many ways, having a full-time, high-powered job is inherently incompatible with being an equally involved parent. Many women have little control over elements of their careers like conflicts between work and school schedules and too much work travel. As a result, many professional women are reducing their work commitments, leaving their jobs, or hiring at-home childcare support. However, at-home childcare is a luxury most American families cannot afford, costing an average of $612 per week. There is also a shortage of affordable child care center options for the average working family, half of all Americans face challenges in securing child care. This shortage of affordable care hinders women's workforce participation and economic mobility, contributing to gender and income inequality. And when women who can afford childcare don't acknowledge they use it, they not only set unrealistic standards for women with fewer resources, they also contribute to the widespread perception that, if they just try hard enough, women can do it all, a narrative that downplays the need for more affordable childcare options. Play by your own rules as she breezed past the one-year anniversary of her commitment to change, Rhymes embraced a desire that had previously caused her confusion and shame, to not get married. She felt liberated when she finally accepted that this was what she wanted and she could disregard what society expected of her. To get there, she had to have a difficult conversation with her boyfriend, and their differences on the matter eventually dissolved the relationship. But Rams describes how, although she grieved, she also felt exhilarated because she felt free to live the life she wanted rather than a life she felt she was supposed to live. As a person without interest in marriage, it's not surprising that Rhymes felt far outside the norm. But, increasingly, she is not alone. American society has long held the expectation and belief that everyone should want to get married. However, the percentage of American adults living without a spouse or partner has risen sharply in the last few decades. In 2019, roughly 38% of adults ages 25 to 54 were neither married nor living with a partner, up from 29% in 1990. Though there are other potential reasons for this decline in partnerships, such a drastic decrease suggests that Ramsey's decision to not marry does indeed reflect a societal shift on the desirability of marriage. Key takeaways society puts people in boxes and imposes rules about how our lives should be. Don't waste your life trying to play by those rules. You can find more happiness by making choices according to your own particular wishes, even if those wishes conflict with what society expects of you. While dismissing society's expectations can be a liberating act that brings greater happiness, for many, throwing off the burden of these expectations and expressing their authentic selves may not be a safe choice. In many home environments, communities, and societies, individuals can face persecution or discrimination for expressing certain aspects of their identity, such as their gender, sexual orientation, or religion, which makes it unsafe for them to be themselves. Commitment number five, let go of stale relationships as Rhymes began to change, her relationships began to change. Before the year of yes, she often didn't see people for who they really were. She describes how, much like she created characters for her shows, she made up supportive, fun personalities for friends who were treating her poorly. But during her year, she let go of friendships that were not good for her and strengthened her friendships with people who genuinely supported her growth. Another way to describe Ramsey's inability to see her friends clearly is that she ignored their red flags. Psychology experts explain that everyone has flaws, but red flags are behaviors that indicate serious problems in the relationship are likely. We ignore red flags in relationships because we don't want to lose people. In an effort to hold on to relationships, we uphold the good first impressions that they made on us by ignoring our current perceptions of them. We also make efforts to create and build on illusions about who they are and how they treat us. 
Look for red flags thoughtfully, don't ignore them and don't overreact, take notice and reflect on how they actually make you feel. Key takeaways as you grow and evolve, people in your life may react poorly to your changes, and they may try to drag you back down. It's better to shed unsupportive friendships and focus on those who love and celebrate your growth. Happy, healthy people are drawn to one another. Unhappy people are the most miserable when a fellow unhappy friend breaks free from their old patterns and blossoms. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe to the Literary Digest for more videos like this one. And don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you found most helpful. Until next time, keep striving for success.